Okay, and we're back on. Okay. So far, we have very abbreviated many invocations. Okay. Uh, to uh, call God is what we have. And the part of the lament is all I got so far is I. Okay. And as far as any they category, that's just at this stage, it's simply something called ruin, destruction to pass by. So that passes by. And then we've got some very limited expression of confidence at this point. Okay? In that latter part, God who can act for me in the mighty God. Okay? Kind of a limited expression of confidence. But that gets a, it seems to get a little stronger in verse 4. He will send from heaven, and he will deliver me. Right? So there's a little stronger sense of confidence there, right? He will bring to shame, or uh, something to the effect of put to shame the person who is after me, but that's kind of interesting. Word. Same word, same word that you use, I think, of a horse snorting and you know, whatnot. I mean, who's who's really uh, tracking me down here. I don't know how it gets translated there. Uh, I can bring it back up if you like. Verse 4. Oh, he will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame and who tramples on me. Quite trampling down on him okay, in that sense. Okay. Yeah, and then there's Sila. Now, you'll notice something about the Adronix model, what I said before. It doesn't break it down the same phrase <coughs> as the verse situation as we found in the text. So after that phrase right there, then there's a Sila. So the next part is the next line, part of the next line. But anyway, it goes on. He will say, God will send his loving kindness and his truth. Now we've got here, he will send, a repetition here, he will send from heaven, right? He will send his loving kindness and his truth. Okay? okay. So that's pretty uh, expanded a little bit on that idea of what he will send, but it's not real specific. Loving kindness, truth, and truth. The problem is, you know, I don't know enough. The problem is somebody's asking my hide here. Okay, let me see how that breaks out. Okay. Now, verse 5, so there's a, a kind of an expression of confidence that's going there. He will act on my behalf by sending, you know, from heaven his truth and loving kindness, and he will deliver me, yes, he will, you know, put to shame the guy who's trying to trap me into the ground. Right? Okay, so both this, and so there's an indication, at least at this point, of the they part. Right? But you'll notice it's not plural, it's singular, singular. Sometimes translations kind of uh, violate the number, plural, and singular. Do we have singular there? Uh, which one? Verse 4. He will try he tramples me down or try to trample me down, trying to follow ten minutes. Uh, uh him who tramples on me. Yeah. Him who tramples on me. Yeah. Okay, so it's singular, they kept it singular, that's good. So um, I'm sure I can find the No, that's supposed to be singular. I'm just saying I'm sure I can find the plural translation. Oh, <laughs> that doesn't very often you do. But at any rate, that singular is important. In the edit, is it reflects the contextual background, doesn't it? He's swimming from before Saul, but there's a whole army out there looking for him, right? But the, the really the key individual is a singular person who's running from him, who's trying to get him, and that's Saul. Okay? Verse 5, we begin to get now back. We're back in, but I'm now back in my disturbed mode here. Okay. <laughs> my soul is in the midst of lions. I must lay down. My soul in the midst of lions. I need to lay down. Now he's got a 
So you can picture him in a cave, hiding. He's getting tired. He's got to lay down. And yet he's right in the middle of a pack of lions here who would like to get a hold of him, right? In this word, Ovatim, there, the sons of men, actually, that's a word that kind of reflects a flashing, a, a angry disposition. I don't know how I got translated there. Uh, fiery beasts. Huh? Is that where you're, fiery beasts? Is that where you're looking? The sons of men, at the sons of men. Uh, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are spears. Yeah, that's before that. Right after I must lay down my soul in the midst of mines. Then I lie down in the midst of fiery beasts. Oh, fire. They took that from the hot, okay. They took that from that particular thing, okay. Their teeth, spears and arrows, right? Okay, now we've got a plural here, okay. Right? Now all of a sudden we move from the previous line from the singular now to the plural. Okay? That's why some of the translations would go back and change the other to the plural sometimes. But at any rate, uh, but this reflects the fact that the lines are plural, right? These sons of men are plural, that is, or after them here. Their T, their arrows, okay? Okay. Their tongue, back to a singular here, tongue with a sharp sword. Okay. Uh, so so we, we got a picture of Saul, who is the primary antagonist here, but who has an army. The army are classified as lions, you know, violent people with spears and arrows about to do them in, if they could find them. But then their tongue, okay. And it doesn't say their tongues, it says their tongue, with a sharp sword, but it is the plural they at that point. Okay. Now, verse 6. So there's a disturbed attitude. There's a, there's a sense of uh, real problems here. Because he's tired and he's laid down and he's afraid to go to sleep. Right? Because he might be caught when he's sleeping. You can see that in the cohortative right here, you know. You must lay down. I've got to lay down, and yet I'm in the midst of this line here. We're after me here. So, verse 6 then comes to what you would classify as, an, as a petition. So we've got now a lament. I've got a problem. Now we've got generally they, right? Okay. It doesn't say you have not done anything this point, although that's implicit, right? Because, in fact, he is in trouble, okay? And God has not yet, God who could act on his behalf has not yet done so, so it's implicit there. Now comes a petition. And it doesn't say here, he's already said that, his petition began earlier, you know, when he says, you know, be gracious to me, right? But now he says what in this petition? He says here, Rise up upon, uh, upon the heavens, O God, upon all the earths, O Lord. Actually, some tra- translate that as what? Uh, which were in verse 6, which uh, would be verse 5, I guess. No? Uh, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. Right. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, over all the earth, your glory and exaltation, I give to the peace itself. Okay. Now that's a, that's a petition at this point. Okay. So he's got a petition there. We're going to see where that petition occurs again later on in the more positive side of this song, but so far it's not there yet. And so it's a petition for God to be exalted and His glory to be expressed over so all the earth, which is a way to say, I suppose, make yourself known here, not only in heaven, but on earth, you know, as it starts with heaven goes to earth. Okay, now verse 7. So there's a sense of a petition, and maybe a sense of confidence or faith that God at least could, you know, do something. He hadn't done anything yet, but He could do something. Okay. Now verse 7 takes them back to the distress aspect again. Okay. 
Jesus. And that they have prepared for my steps. Now we get another picture of how Saul was trying to trap him here. Right? So they lay down into the various traps in the various paths around the mountain or whatever to see if they could catch him in some fashion. And that they have laid down and prepared for my steps. Right? You would take that literally then, not figuratively? Yeah, I would mean, take that literally. Do they, and very often the translators go into a figurative idea for some of this one. It should be literal. Okay. Did they take it literal there? Or did they they said it meant for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way that they had fallen into it themselves. Okay, so they took the literal words okay, in that sense. They had okay, spiritualized it away. Okay. So they have. A net, notice it's fronted, that is, it's put on front, the direct object. So his focus is upon his, his uh, dangers again. A net they have laid down for myself. So if I try to run, I might fall in one of their nets, right? Uh, my soul will bow down, which is an expression of what? Some, some translate. Uh, I would say maybe exhaustion. Maybe. It could be, but just take it. You could just take it from the standpoint of the literal aspect. Okay, here's a net. Where's the net? For my steps. Well, that's down on the ground there. They're going to trap me. And so my soul, which is a, a uh, phrase that is often used simply for the first person, that is I, right? I mean, they talk about me. It might be, it might be that he could be, gee, this makes me depressed, could met, take a metaphorical view, but also it could be related to the very fact that he had practically got his eyes on the ground all the time looking for his trap, okay, right? Could be that way. They had a dug, they had dug before, they had dug a pit before me, so I've got to keep my eyes on the ground or I might fall into this pit or into this net or something and be a caught, right? Right? Okay. So there's a danger that's being expressed here and an anxiety over this, right? And then, but then there's a sense of confidence at the very end of that. This part right here, because it reflects, uh, it reflects a principle that comes runs throughout the Old Testament of retribution in crime. Right? God says, you know, you dig a pit, you fall into the pit yourself, you know, and you make it a problem. And so he's got that kind of statement, they will fall. Actually it can't be translated, they have fallen into the midst of it because they haven't. I don't know if it translates that, but it's a perfect. It certainly wouldn't be a perfect of uh, a past time event. Not here. This one book now has got it as past sense. Yes, yeah, so what does that mean? How does that fit even fit the context? I mean, it's, a, it's an ongoing situation here. I think you have to take that more like a prophetic purpose. There was good as far as into the net itself, because that's the principle God laid out, right? Okay. The, 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 I think he is appealing at that point pretty much to what he had alluded to earlier as loving kindness and truth and one of the truths of his of the, that he knows and is aware of is the fact that God has set up a principle of this retribution in kind. You dig a net, you get caught in the net. You dig a pit for somebody, you yourself get caught in the pit. So this pretty much has to be a pathetic perfect, it seems to me. They have good as fallen into it and into his midst. Now, they're not in the net. They're, he's still in the cave, and they're still running around. Okay? But he has a sense of confidence there. Now, having come to that point, look, verse 8, where we started before. My heart is fixed. That is, set, if you will. Okay? It's, in a, it's no longer fluctuating. And by the way, what does the word heart mean? What is, what is the reference to the heart? Well, I am not having palpitations anymore. Not, the pump is not fluttering anymore. Well, not really. In this case, in this case, the heart has to relate to the emotional state that he was in, because he was all 
in and out of ambivalent feelings of emotional states previously, and now his emotional state becomes fixed in a positive vein. Something happened between verses 7 and 8 to bring him to that point. Okay. Something happened. And that's why I would say the oracle of salvation came in. How did it come? We don't know. It might be the very fact that he had some theology that preceded, that he's got embedded in here, that preceded this point in his life. What, what are some of the theology we've seen so far? God. The word for God there, of course, is uh, the one that emphasizes his power and sovereignty. Control, L-D. Most high, right? That is, he's certainly sovereign over all. And the God who can act for me on my behalf, okay, that's part of the God. Yeah, he's able to do that. He's most high, and he certainly can help me here. He can send, he hasn't done it yet, but he can send from heaven, right? And he can save me, right? He can deliver me from this guy who's trying to trample me into the ground. He can, send his, he can act on the basis of his loving kindness and his truth. Okay. Right. So far, he's got quite a good theology that's being developed in, in the back of his mind there. It's already there. The exalted above the heavens, O God, the exalted your, your glory above the earth. Okay. Kind of a petition. Uh, acknowledgement of God's greatness again. Right? So he's got some background and he's got some information apparently of the theory of retribution and kind that God had frequently talked about in self probably experience. Okay. So he's got a pretty good theology at this point. Okay. Now it may be that the oracle that I was talking about, that is the communication, it may be that the thinking and meditating upon who God is as he knows him has then brought him to a place where emotionally he can settle down and not worry because he believes in the God who can do this. It may be some other means whereby God communicated to him, but something happened to bring him to this state now of uh, emotional steadfastness, so you could say, my emotions are now fixed in a positive thing. He beats it twice. My, mo- my heart is fixed. Uh, my heart is fixed. Then instead of what? Well, how would you know you're in a positive emotional state? I must sing a song. I must make some music here. Right? Okay. Cohort is again about what he wants to do. I, I want to do this. Okay. And then here, what? Arouse my glory. Now that's a terminology that's kind of used of uh, um, Paul, I mean, uh, David's, uh, I think, skill, abilities, abilities, and music. And, and that seems to be par- in the parallel line, seems to be amplified or explained. So arouse my glory. Uh, arouse heart and I've known of this, I must arouse the dawn. Right? I don't know how to translate the waking the dawn. The idea is, notice that concept there kind of relates to the preceding part. Notice what he said in verse 5 up here. I need to lie down and sleep. I'm afraid to lie down and sleep. Okay. I must arouse and wake the dawn. I can't wait till morning comes so that I can make this music and do this great thing that I now feel I can do. Verse 10 Praise you among the people, O Lord, Master. I must make, I will make music to you. Right? You must come, uh, proclaim to the peoples, to people of God's greatness and goodness. But keep in mind, as far as we know, he hadn't been delivered yet. It's now that he's confident that he will be delivered. I will praise you among the peoples. 
I will sing songs to the amongst the people as well. Because when I pray that look most verse eleven, a reason established, because great unto the heavens is your loving kindness, okay, and unto the clouds is your truth. We've seen loving kindness and truth appear, right? What did he say about it there? Well, he will send down his loving kindness and his truth. Not the movement is from there to here, from up to down, from heaven to earth. That's the movement. But now, down below, the movement is the other direction it appears to be. Greatness unto the heavens appears to be in another direction. And when he's talking about praise, and praising God for his truth and his loving kindness, now the movement is upward. And so when we come to verse 12, which is the repetition of verse 6, Be exalted above the heavens, O God, above all the earth, your glory. This is a statement of praise, and this is a statement of petition. It was earlier, it was a petition. Show me your, show us your greatness. Show me your greatness and your glory here in trouble. Down here, the praise of the fact that he is in fact exalted and his glory is over all the years. So what we have when we look at the formal aspect of this again, we had a very brief, almost non-existent invocation. We started with a lament that says, I'm in great trouble. Okay. Okay. We had an expression of confidence. It wasn't, a, you know, a, I feel good about things now. It was, gee, there's, a, there's some hope out there, maybe. I mean, I you know something about God. And then a petition occurs. It actually, it occurred right at the beginning with the invocation, so to speak. But then here, here, he, here the petition was initially, it was, be gracious, I need help. And then it was, be exalted, you know, show your greatness, right? Intervene, trample down, just save me, trample down the enemy, right? Or put the disgrace the enemy who's trying to trample me down, put the shame, that was the term translated to use, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's significant in and of itself, too, because think in terms of who he sees as the enemy. Saul, who's God's anointed, and he doesn't want, he doesn't say kill him. Okay, so he put him to shame. But then what happened in that incident? We can look back, back on the incident. He could have he killed him in the cave. Saul in the cave. But he didn't. And later on, he called down to him and Saul left the cave, and Saul was ashamed. He became ashamed of his actions. And he decided to go home at least at that time. Until the next time. Yeah, until the next time. Right. And then there was an oracle response, which is not listed. And then there was praise. Good. And then there was a vow of praise. Well, a vow of praise in the sense that I'm determined to say and, make, and let people know I want to declare abroad all of the things that I can't wait till the morning. So there's an example where there's a lot of variation to this individual event. But the variation brings the whole thing to life. It's not a dead form. You see what I'm saying? It's not a form that I have to force the words into the right format. It's a form that here allows the Ambivalence, the emotional ambivalence that come full sway, okay, and then to to just kind of go back and forth in different directions as as it would be for most of us who have difficulties and encounter difficulties, but then finally to get to the place where we can say our emotions become fixed and we're no longer ambivalent emotionally. We want a straight and narrow or straight path. We can praise God without the ambivalence that we are expressing before. Right? Pretty, pretty human is what that is. Real human. So that's why I say, and that's what I want to emphasize is pay attention to the form. Right? Then examine. 
variations on the thing. That's key. That's significant. Okay. The key to the interpretation. So you have any questions on that? Yeah. I don't know if I can speak to that. I don't know enough to ask a question. I guess the other thing I would say to you is that you will you will never really be able to uh, interpret one of these psalms probably with great effectiveness if you don't do the detail work. Right? You've got to do the analysis. You got to know how the words fit together syntactically. Okay? You got to listen to the song. You got to listen for the emotion. When he says, "Be gracious to me," well, that's okay. But when he says it twice, we know that there's a little bit of emotion involved. And then when he repeats down here, "My heart is fixed," my heart is there's a complete change that took place here. Right. And maybe that's part of the answer. Yeah. To so mm-hmm. being being merciful. Yeah. There's no change to the steadfastness. Right. Yeah. But the emotional change is uh, just amplified, if you will. And the repetition. We saw the repetition. We saw verse six repeated in verse seven without any variation whatsoever. And yet, sense of what is communicated by that those verses are different. One, it's a prayer for God to come and do his thing. And the other one, it's a praise that God does his thing. And it's exactly the same word. Uh, you, see, you see the movement from heaven to earth. That's his plea and hope in his anxious moments. When his heart is fixed and now he's free to praise God, it's in the other direction. It's fascinating. Okay. He's got to do the detailed work. Otherwise, you don't see how to do stuff. And that's only one of many, many songs that we do. Okay, now, let's take a break. Text, which you have to do in church. <laughs> Shout joyful to the jump joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Can that 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 will work very well though. No, the colors aren't real great. Let's see, um, let me uh, let me let me get out of this thing and go back and change the design and make it look like something uh, yeah, maybe you could change the color scheme. Color scheme, let's see. Let's see. Go to the color schemes, and then at the bottom, there should be a. That'll work, right? Yeah, that looks okay. This, okay. Is, this hopefully doesn't change all your fonts and stuff too much. So. Yeah, okay. Let's see if that'll work. Okay. Yeah, that shows up a lot better. Balloons and everything. Oh, oh birthday. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, <laughs> shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Sir, notice what I have in brackets. Okay, we'll get to that there. The Lord of gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. I'll explain why I've got these laid out the way I do. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and that we ourselves. <laughs> we are his people, and she can be pasture. And he was gates with thanksgiving and his course of praise and thanks to him, bless his name. Notice the number on the other side. One, two, three, four, three, two, one. What do you think I'm talking from developing? I'm going to guess he has a good work. Here's the Hebrew text. Okay. Shout to the Lord all earth. Serve the Lord gladness. Come before him with thanksgiving our green shall. 
Lord Yahweh, He is God. He has made us, and not we. His people and the sheep of His pasture. Come now, notice the connectedness is here. Come to His gates with thanksgiving, His course with praise, praise the Lord, bless His name. Okay, now we've got number one, shout to the Lord all the year. Okay. And bless His name, I'm suggesting to you that they're related. Then I got serve the Lord that way with gladness, joy, parallel to praise Him. I'm suggesting there to you. He, this whole thing, in part, is the number three. Come before Him with the shout of joy, or the shout. In the end verse 4, then verse 3, come to his course with praise. Let's see. Okay. His course with the Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay. That is, we've got the same verb that occurs, right? we got the same verb that occurs. Okay. And the second one, that is number 3, just simply amplifies what's involved in the first number three there. Okay. If that's true, uh, that this, this is an accurate picture, then a couple of things emerge here. One, everything in one, two, and three it points to what four is all about. And then growing out of number four, you repeat the things one, two, and three that you verse order. Okay. Which puts the focus of attention then on verse four, which is not where the focus of attention is typically in this passage. Okay. Uh, repetition leads to the chiasmus. Repetition would we mean, well, the repetition of come before him with bringing shower of Thanksgiving, come to his course, it's just time to find where to go, okay, with praise, his course, or, yeah, you know, course, his gates, rather than his course with praise, okay, so that's a repetition. Repetition leads to that, okay, if the first two mean the same thing, and the second, number one, essentially means the same thing as number one, Bottom. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Well, what, what are you kind of shouting? Are you supposed to what, wanting to do? But bless His name. That's how it's done. But then you've got serve the Lord with gladness. Okay. Now, what is this word serve? Does that mean, what does that mean? How, how come I translated that? You would call it here in worship. Okay. Well, if you look up B and B, you look up the word Kavad, you find out that in these, in the context of service, that is temple worship, the word serve, in fact, does mean, has the concept of worship. Okay? And so everything then is leading to verse 4. Chiasmus leads to the focal point. How does it lead there? Well, because you got one, two, three ideas, and that number four there is twice as long, if not more than twice as long, as the rest of it. If you were to scan it, for instance, you have one, two, three for number one, and three, three for number two, and this point number two on top. And then you add one, two, three for number three. Number four, you add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then you come to number three on the bottom. Be one, two, three, and then on the half line be four, five, and then be one, two, three for the next one. Okay. I'm going to have some space here. 
Seven imperatives, count them out. Go back to it in the Hebrew. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? Which is, you know, some significance in biblical things there. Seven imperatives. The reason for the whole is given in the last line, but I don't have the last line. Previous laid out it's because Yahweh is good. Uh, oh, his loving kindness is forever, and through generation from generation, this is faithfulness. Okay. So the application to Psalm would be the Lord is good, the Lord is good. That would be the reason for the statement. Okay. His loving kindness is everlasting, it's his last line. His faithfulness extends to all generations. Okay. Okay. But now there's a significant dimension here of what I usually add verbally. And that's the fact as the concentration on what verse number four says. Notice what these the shout joyfully is a oh kind of an idea is that it's a emotionally as opposed to uh, it's, it's, it's an emotional kind of term shout okay. serve is a different kind of term it's kind of related to the will right no what does that relate to first of the mind right when we come back and we just enter into his gates with thanksgiving and we'll enter him, that relates to the will, to the will. Give thanks to him and that will bless his name while he raise for the emotions. But the center of this whole thing has got to do with the intellectual dimension. Right? So a lot of the... Um, Worship type people that I sometimes deal with and who are maybe in, in fact, who were in the sessions that I've used this, hear me say that in fact the key to successful and effective worship is knowing the knowledge of the Lord. And notice what it says here. Know that the Lord, He Himself, is God. So there's something about true theology there. It is He who made us, He's a creator. Right? Not we ourselves. I think that translation is too, there's a textual problem there. Not we are he and us and not we are so let's see what's that? Oh, yeah. And it translates that says low instead of not. It takes it as uh, he had made us and we did we, not us. Something like that. That's what I'll do. Okay. And then we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So the, the issue is, the knowledge aspect is knowing who God is and in, our, and in connection with that, who we are in relationship to him. Right? So we've got the knowledge of God that's accurate, and true of course, and a clear awareness of our own status placement in relationship to God. That becomes the heart, if you will, of the work, the true and genuine worship. So let's put it in 
other terms, to have people sing just to use a for a, a song that sometimes people use, uh, have people sing Kumbaya, is absolutely unrelated to worship. If the worship has to do with something about saying something about God and something about ourselves, that doesn't say anything. These people don't know what I mean. Right? Or, the hallelujah, 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 praise Lord. That doesn't say anything. And that's, in fact, hallelujah is just a command saying praise God, which is to say, say something about God. And when we say hallelujah, hallelujah, we're not saying anything about God. I think mean, that is not praise, that is not worship, and that has no connection with knowledge at all. Okay? It's not worship. It doesn't fit the paradigm at all. Okay? So sometimes I go overboard, and I'll admit this, even to the people who are watching the DVD, that sometimes I get upset with some of the worship contemporary worship music that we use, when you analyze what kinds of content, it doesn't have any solid content. And therefore, it doesn't really qualify as worship, even though we like to clap our hands and stomp our feet. That in itself is not worship. So the psalm here focuses our attention on knowing God and knowing who we are and that gives us then something with which to express and worship. And we do unfortunately at least in my, some of my context that I find myself in there's not a whole lot of that going on in the contemporary scene. It's kind of sad. Maybe you have a different experience. Maybe the man who brings you in. <laughs> Not at all. Um, there are some good contemporary songs out there with some real solid meat to it. But there's an awful lot out there that just doesn't say anything. Okay. So at any rate, that's a different. Now, the, that particular song, then, the, the development of that phrase, him, if you will, is the whole thing is developed on this chiastic model. And if you miss the center, you miss the whole thing. Okay? And too often, when this song is preached, it misses the center. Okay? And therefore, it just does not. Uh, and missing, and missing the center, you just kind of misinterpreted the song, and you misapply the song, and you perpetuate the center of it with the lack of center, which is ignorance. Okay, and it seems to me that our worship should enhance our understanding of God and ourselves, and give praise to Him in that light. And too often, it doesn't do that. That's it. <coughs> I'm sorry, as a worship leader, are you one of those? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry if some of your 7 Eleven songs don't fit the model. <laughs> you know what I mean by 7 Eleven? Some words are people at the time. Yeah, I've always wondered, and this is not a, I don't think a negative thing, at least I hope it's not. I always wonder why it is, and some of these contemporary songs, they repeat the same thing two or three times, that, and when they, in fact, they could seem, seem to me come up with other words, you know, to deepen the thinking, the thought pattern of it, and yet they don't. They just like to say the same thing three or four or more times. And I don't know why that is. I think maybe you can tell me. But it seems to me that if they can figure out lyrics to go with the tune for one verse, why they can't come up with other lyrics to go with the same tune for another verse. Uh, I don't understand that. Um, so, anyway, that's... Any, um, 
further questions on it? I want to talk a little bit about what it looked like in doing exegetical work and then coming up with a paper, let's say, for or a sermon you know, for Hindu literature. Well, number one, we do a solid exegetical work, of course, and okay, all the aspects of it. And we would take out of some sort of a, a book like this or something we do to so remember to look for these and this and the other thing. That is the format, look up for our Western on, see how he breaks it down. Compared to all the things we've been talking about, okay? But then, what you would ultimately want to come up with, it would seem to me, would be a song, typically speaking, isn't going to have five or six or seven points to it, okay? And it's not going to be related in one part of the song to, the, to focus on the emotion, and another part of the song to focus on the mind over here, okay? It's really going to be pretty centralized as to what it's doing, a single focus kind of thing, okay? Most songs are like that. And so you would want to carefully analyze it to the point where you can see where the song's focus is. Okay? And then you would go through and you would you may not be able to work through the song verse by verse every time. Okay? In other words, in the pattern in which it flows. It may not work very well. Okay? You may have to extract some aspects of it from different parts. You know, and then create a point and then some extract some other ones, right? When I was when I would produce however Psalm fifty seven for a sermon and teacher preach that and then both, okay, in that one, the point that we're trying to get at or the psalm is getting at is the emotional ambivalence in the real world, right? to finally move to emotional stability when we get it all connected together, that we are in our thinking with our theology and our real life together, you see. Right? So I would, in that sense, I like to keep in the sermon and the teaching aspect and do it. Get them to feel good and bad and worried and anxious all at the same time. And then finally extract them and the those elements within the song that produce the stability. And that would be two parts. And then you would just deal with the latter part. And in the introduction of a song like that, and this would be true if I were writing a paper on it, I would do the exegetical work, and then I would, for instance, on the historical aspect of it, okay, I would not only deal with the superscription issue, I would then look at the psalm and extract things within the psalm itself that can reflect what the superscription says as background. Okay, it may be that I even want to go in the first Samuel story, you know, to extract ideas just to get the bigger picture of that event, which one, which event, which cave he was in, etc. And front that, put that in front of the message. Okay. So I want to clarify that, that the details of the message relate to a very real setting, a very, very, very real situation. But then I would go into the message proper with this focus on the emotional endurance and stability factors that we're working on. On the idea of, of the psalm that we just looked at, Psalm 100, okay, I would want to do some of course, after the exegetical work and everything, and preparing a message or a paper on that, I want to make sure that I clearly, I, since the key is this classic structure that I define it okay, and convinced of it, but I want to make sure and clear that the people or in the paper that it would be demonstrated forcefully. And that's the key to the whole thing. If you miss that, you miss the whole thing. Okay. And then what I would do in development, okay, since that focal point would be at that one verse, that lengthy verse, I would focus that one right up front. I would jump into the middle of it. And then I would allow that middle to be radiated to the other parts. I wouldn't start 
running through the verses itself. Okay? I've explained the chiastic structure, so I got me to the middle. And I would interpret the middle very strongly, of course, and then show how this middle needs to radiate or radiates in both directions. Okay. The part purpose of that song is to focus on that one passage, that knowing aspect, which should then influence the other worship, service, emotions, etc. Okay. So that's how I would approach that, both in the paper and in the sermon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it depends. So there's another song, other songs, uh, Psalm 17, for instance. It's got to do with, David's got a problem because people are saying bad things about him. <laughs> and he's mad at God, too. Okay. But I would word that one verse by verse. Because, in fact, in working verse by verse, it tends to, what should we say, it tends to, um, well, one section tends to depend upon the other for the movement to the final end. So when you get to the end, when you, the problem is never gets resolved, but he is resolved that God can have, God will take care of the problem. He's agitated at the very beginning. He's upset. He's got some good principles that he's following. But God never says, I'm going to solve the problem. Okay. And, but he learns to live with the answer whatever God comes up with. Okay. Towards the end. And so it leads to a climax. If you will. And that climax is not always the one or the answer. It's not always the one we look for when we got a problem and ask God for the answer. Okay. And so the climax leads to well, you know, whatever you want to, whatever God wants to do is the right thing. Right? I mean, and I can live with that. Whatever God wants to do. It to, okay. And he ends up with whether I live or die. It's almost a new point, he said, because I, in righteousness, you know, I will see your face. I will be satisfied when I awake in your life. I mean, that's how he ends. I, I, they, they may, they're mad at me, they're speaking bad things, they're after me, they may kill me. God never says anywhere that he's not going to save them here. He never really directly gives them that oracle, if you will. And he lives with the outcome wherever God determines it's going to be the outcome. So I would deal with that one right straight on through because it comes to that it, it comes to that as a climactic element there, come at a climactic point of not just resignation, but faith resignation, if you will. And that's where we would want to lead people to in, in a time of distress. So it depends on how you what the song says is, is how it would get developed to me. Many of them would um, be developed, well, song, many of the songs would be developed in quite different ways to, do it, to get the effect properly, it seems to me. But that would be for next term, for the sermon. I think I'll, maybe I'll give you an imprecatory song to preach from. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Think of people in your life that you don't like and you just pray about just like them. Yeah, right, that's right. That's very cool. I did a turn around and write to songs and I have done a study for the first time. They're not easy to do, but they can, they can be effective. Now let's all pray for slow and painful death for the person sitting here right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's all I want to say on Psalms unless you want, on the Hindu aspect, unless you want to do something more. Okay. Let's look at the last part of the notes in the theological analysis. Okay. <clears throat> Again, just point to some, there, uh, some books that have to do with uh, really stuff, theological things, and I don't have, you see, John Bright is good. 
but he's neo-orthodox even though he's relatively conservative and neo-orthodox. Okay, but it's good in the sense of using and preaching the Old Testament from the standpoint of not abandoning its theology when you're trying to preach to the Christians. Okay? That's good. Uh, let's see. I would, and these others like Finnegan and, and uh, Payne and the Bull, they give you background information and theological, and the, or the theology, the Old Testament theology. But it isn't really preaching, uh, they aren't really the books that help us to set the bright, help us to focus upon communicating the theology of the Old Testament properly in the church. And tra- making the transfer from the old to the new. That's what I guess very well. I'm going to expand this bibliography later on. Right now, I'm going to have it expanded and further. The point, based upon strict exegesis of the text, biblical theology, and actually precedes systematic theology. There's a tendency in some schools and among some theologians for theology to take over even to take over or take first place. Okay. And maybe that's our tendency in some ways where we have our theology, we're convinced of it, so we impose it. Right? And we don't do it. One of my professors said always be doing our theology by exegesis. In other words, always allowing our exegesis Biblical, the biblical text to inform our theology and, if necessary, to change it. Okay? And that's really tough, for, especially for uh, systematic theologians to do. Okay? Jews advocating huh? changing your exegesis based on your theology. My theology, if my theology is imposing itself on the text to the point where it's telling the text what it says instead of the text informing my theology as to whether it's on or off, okay, then, see, that's an error. Okay. But which one was your professor saying? Oh, he wants, he was saying, uh, and I would say as well, that the exegesis of the text needs to inform our theology, theological thinking. Okay, I, I heard you backwards. Oh, oh okay, well, I don't want to say it backwards. <laughs> Uh, I had one, well, when I was doing my dissertation, okay, I did some work. The professors, who was a, uh, one professor, particularly one of my readers, one of my readers who was the head of the theology department, he had to have one outside of the department. He was the one outside of the department, the head of the theology, and he didn't like my conclusions. And so he said, he, he suggested that I include a theological, um, a deeper, a greater theological dimension to one aspect of what I was working through. Okay. Now I did that. Okay. If you want to graduate, you do what they tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that, and it came out the way I came, it came out strengthening my position. So I submitted the, the dissertation there with that strengthened position based in part upon the theology that I was working on, right? Well, he still didn't like it because he didn't like my conclusions. And essentially he said to me, he said, what I want you to do is to take the theology out and take that theology back out. And he told me directly, he said, you know, you're more of an exegete than, than a theologian in that area. And my conclusion was, well, shouldn't our theology be a product of our exegesis? Right? And he was thinking the other way. Not, I'm sure he could, wouldn't verbalize it that way. He would say, my theology is 
strictly based upon exegesis of the text. But, when push came to shove, or when the exegesis of the text didn't correlate with the word he wanted the theology to end up. See, he wanted to push the theology and uh, to change the conclusion of the text. He, but he had nothing he could, he had nothing he could say against my exegetical work. <clears throat> that demonstrated it was off track or, or anything. Okay. But that's a tendency that tends to happen. And it can happen, it happens to us too when we think we're right. But for instance, if we believe in one saved, always saved, then we run into a text that doesn't seem on the surface to say that, we're going to make it say that. Right? <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we got a good at rationalizations for why we can justify it. We make it say that. Okay. But what we really should do is what? We should really set aside our precon- preconditions of what it means, do the solid exegesis of the text, and see what it means. And that's scary. What if it led in a direction that challenged your Theological structure, that's scary. Okay? So, that's a danger problem. Okay. So, we need to discover the belief structures of the people within their own time, culture, setting. It's just simply solid exegetical work. We don't impose a 20th century ideas or culture on the Old Testament. We try to figure out what the Old Testament culture is and therefore understand the text on that basis. Okay? That's what we need to do. Okay? We also need to recognize that the structure of the Old Testament in the theological sense is incomplete. I mean, it always points to Christ, but it never, it only, it only, only in prophecy does it ever get there. All right? The New Testament completes it out. I got Galatians here, Romans, and five Old Testament revelation can be characterized into a rather than not sure. This is self leads and appreciation of understanding the function of the Old Testament text, explaining some of the difference between the Old and New Testaments. And once these are understood, then we can apply the Old Testament to the Christian understanding of living in a proper and good way. As a matter of fact, my book, you'll see that it comes out of my book that will be very cool. I focus that um, idea. Systematics should always be submissive. Sorry. To the exegetical and biblical theological roots. Okay. So that's what we need to be careful of. Okay. Um, once this perspective is adopted philosophically and emotionally, then you and me have a much easier, more enjoyable time working in the Old Testament. Because okay. no longer becomes a Correct. Okay. So, just make sure we keep it as Jewish theology, recognize it's incomplete, recognize it's, it's uh, not bad, it's not anti Christian, we're not going to be Marcionites, we're not going to throw everything Old Testament out, we're not going to be New Testament Christians, we're going to be Bible believing Christians. And recognizing that, in fact, <clears throat> apart from the Old Testament, a lot of our theology is... Uh, where do we get the creation story? And more, and more importantly, where does original sin come in? Right? And a need for salvation. So there's so many things that are dependent upon the Old Testament. And you need that. So, okay. Now, let me just, a biblical theological study of source, very, very short, but I did in a little paper here. Fourth Commandment, biblical theological test case. Mm-hmm. And you see the commandments today. Fourth Commandment is which one? Well, I'll keep the Sabbath day. Go to church on Saturday. Go to church on Sunday, right? Do we keep the Ten Commandments? No, we keep nine commandments. We need to keep the Ten Commandments. Can we say we keep the Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment? 
and let's see. Why do you recognize and accept it that the Ten Commandments represent timeless moral principles? With the exception of the Fourth Commandment, perhaps. <laughs> because we're not Seventh day Adventists. I don't know that we're not Seventh day Adventists. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But is this really an exception in the question? One theory of integrating Old Testament Jewish religious requirements of New Testament Christian conduct is through the medium of biblical theology. Model suggests that the underlying many, if not most, of the Old Testament laws are timeless theological principles that transfer the New Testament obligations even when the Old Testament vehicle laws are not obligatory. Moss model, the Lord Commandment remains as applicable as the other nine. And so we have to look what is the underlying issue with the Fourth Commandment there. Key to working the biblical theology model to separate the underlying theological principle from the legal surface requirement. In the case of the fourth commandment, the surface legal requirement is the Sabbath day. But what is underlies that? That's the question. The real question. It gives it in the huh? It gives it in the list, doesn't it? It gives it in what? The reason? Yeah, we're going to get it. Okay. <laughs> One clear motivational theme for the fourth commandment is seen in Exodus 20, verse 11. Yahweh created in six days, rested on the seventh. Therefore, this is what you're getting at, Yahweh blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart. Theologically, God does not tire, just relate to what this text is saying. Therefore, the seventh day resting cannot be for physical recuperation. Not God. Possible clue to the meaning of divine resting is seen in Genesis 131. Okay. And God saw all that she had made, right? and told it was very good. So it says there. It was time for reflection and enjoyment of his creation. And that's what he was doing. Would this be the underlying purpose for this fourth commandment? And if so, it's part of the Sabbath. Right? The fourth commandment, as seen in Deuteronomy, Suggests, which is ten commandments in the economy, that the purposes for it revolve around resting and reflecting. Verse 12 and verse 14 is unambiguous. In order that he might, your servant and your manservant and your maid servant may rest like you. There is a need for the individual to stop working and rest. Exodus 20 and 11 picks up the rest of this thing as well. Because this resting is unlike God, people do get tired. The Deuteronomy 5 strongly indicates that reflection is also part of the reason for the command. Verse 15 continues the purpose follows verse 14. Okay. What does it say? And you remember, I can't see it there. It's a little fuzzy in the text here. You remember that uh, you were a servant, in, uh, excuse me, a slave in the land of Egypt. And Yahweh your God brought you out from there with a strong hand, right? And with an outstretched arm. Okay? And that continues the purpose clause in that verse 14. Reflecting on God's work of salvation and, just to add to that, that event, the Exodus event, is the kind of the salvation experience of the Old Testament, uh, is some kind of near equivalent to what the cross represents in the New okay. So, reflecting on God's work of salvation on behalf is the essence of the verse, and the fourth commandment is seen in the last clause of the verse. Therefore, God commanded you to. Command you to keep or to do keep the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath day, essentially. Instead of reflecting on their own work, however, as God did, they are to reflect on Yahweh's saving work. Other than the parallel between God's seventh day and that of God's people. 
there's nothing in there that encourages us for a fourth commandment that demands a particular day to rest and reflection. As the covenant issue for Israel, however, the Sabbath is designated the day of worship. Okay? But in the purposes, there's nothing that says can only be performed on the seventh day. Okay? When one reflects on the New Testament in regards to the fourth commandment, it's clear that a particular day is not the primary issue. There's no word we have repeated. The early New Early Jewish Christians, in fact, went to synagogue on the Sabbath and gathered together again on Sunday. Then, after the Jewish Christian rift about 64 AD, because keep in mind that prior to that time, Christianity was not considered a different religion, it was a different sect of Judaism. It was a sect of Judaism. Okay. By the way, that paradigm has a lot of effect on the interpretation of the New Testament books and passages, and we have not done a very good job in making that connection. But someday I would like to write a book on that. Okay, wait a minute. Um, the Christians use Sunday as their day for rest and reflection in part based on Sunday as Christ's resurrection day, the foundational point of the Christian faith, and which of course highlights that issue of salvation, doesn't it? Death, burial, and resurrection. Without the resurrection, we wouldn't have, as, said, as Paul says, uh, the ability to thank God for our salvation because we would never know that in fact he accepted Christ's sacrifice. Okay. So the direct, one direct reference to the fourth commandment in the church directed portions of the New Testament is in Hebrews 4. The point of that allusion is not on the Sabbath as a proper day for worship, but as a reflection of the saving work of God for his people, precisely what is noted for the purpose of both men in Deuteronomy 15, 515. Also in Hebrew, there's an emphasis on a congregational gathering of Christians. And that parallels the Old Testament idea of a particular day of worship by God's people. Thus, the New Testament continues the Old Testament purpose for the fourth commandment. Remember the purpose, right? Without carrying on the covenantal requirement of maintaining the Sabbath day as the only proper day for worship, any day can be used, keeping it holy, that is set aside for resting and reflecting on God's saving work. This is as much a New Testament as it is an Old Testament. So do we keep the fourth commandment? I say without apology, I keep the fourth commandment. Right? Interpreted based on the biblical theology model. And through, through the very statements of the Old Testament in regard to it, and how the New Testament deals with it. There's nothing I do to violate if I want to work on Wednesday, Tuesday, as long as I'm fulfilling the purposes, then I'm keeping the fourth commandment. I was really witnessing one time on a bike ride, witnessing on a bike ride, and ran into this guy at one rest stop. Rest stop. And we got witnessing to him, and he was kind of anti Christian in some ways. And, and uh, he was saying, Well, you Christians aren't better than you. Don't, you know, uh, you don't, you're not better than anybody else. You know, I mean, uh, you keep the, you don't follow the same man. What do you mean? I'm not following that. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I don't have an idol in my house. He said, but you don't worship on, you don't go to church on Saturday. Well, no, I ride my bike on Saturday. No, I ride my bike on Saturday. (laughs) See, you don't keep the Ten Commandments, right? You say, well, yes, I do keep the Ten Commandments. And he has to explain to them, of course, the issue, but. His, his real rationale for you Christians are no better than me, and I don't need to be a Christian because, uh, you know, you don't keep the Ten Commandments either. It really doesn't work. It doesn't fly, but that was his rationale for not wanting to become a believer. Okay. That was his excuse, if you will. So, anyway, that's one. Biblical theological test case okay. that is very often thrown up in our face. 
by the Seven Day Adventists and other people. And, and non Christians as well as Christians. Okay. We get a letters from the church every once in a while. There's a guy who lives in the canyon, and his ministry is he writes letters to churches explaining how we're way off base theologically because we meet on Sunday. Oh, is that right? And if we mm-hmm. want to be in step with what the Lord has for us, then we can change to Saturday. Well, maybe you need to write back to him and explain it to him. Ed is an if you buy him a bit. Do that in my free time. Huh? So I'll do that in my free yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free time. That's the next time. <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, 2 3 3. Mm-hmm. That's all I want to say about that. That really finishes out our notes. What else I want to do? Get rid of um, my drawings here. Just a little bit. It's not going to be anymore. You're going to go advertising for your book in between the DVD. Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. Bye. Available at Amazon.com <laughs> and. What? Available at Amazon.com and CBD for about $18. What? Your book. <laughs> Actually, no, it's cheaper than Amazon. Than yeah, it so, somewhere in there. But it takes it doesn't take a lot longer to get it. Do you have a Christian book? CBD? No, 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 not yet. It's just recently it's been started to get placed in uh, various uh, online things. Uh, I wanted to talk about. And unfortunately, the others are going to take a test. We aren't here, but we need to talk about the test you're going to take. Or also, a paper. You get the paper in, get your study done, the paper in, or the end of the semester, okay, or the quarter, okay, which is the end of the quarter is the 2nd of March, I believe, okay, which is, uh, you know, very shortly, put it bluntly. Very shortly. Yeah, get it in. And then because the next quarter starts the fifth in March. So you have time to go to the bathroom and then you gotta go go again. <laughs> That's about it. Okay. Okay. Now I don't come up here though when that early. Okay. Are you coming up extra? I am. I am. I'm coming up on the twenty first of March. And then again on the 18th of April. Okay, that's what I'm coming up. Okay. Word. What? Well, oh, we, had, we had talked previously about trying to avoid a Wednesday. Did you and Carl talk about that at all? Uh, no, I haven't talked about that. What they want to do is, you can cut that 